T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Engines full power. And lift off of Starlink. Go Starlink, go Falcon. Another successful launch of a Falcon rocket with a bunch more satellites for Elon Musk's Starlink constellation. What no one knew that day was that 33 of the 49 satellites would fall back to Earth and burn up in our atmosphere. Starlink is a constellation of LEO satellites. LEO, low Earth orbit. Most TV and communication satellites fly 33,000 kilometers above the Earth. But Starlink wanted small dish, two-way, low latency internet communication. Their solution is to fly over 10,000 satellites just 500 kilometers above your house. Well within the region we call the ionosphere. Just the same as before any flight, Starlink technicians checked the weather. Space weather. NOAA, or the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, publish a space weather forecast, letting satellite, communication, airlines and utility companies know when the sun is more active than usual. But that day Starlink misunderstood the full implications of the space weather forecast. A recent solar storm was heading towards Earth. Satellites in geostationary orbit might be mildly affected. But what NOAA's space weather forecast was not designed to predict was how the Earth's upper atmosphere was going to absorb the full impact of the sun's weather. 33 Starlink satellites were destroyed that day. When Earth's upper atmosphere expanded, caused more drag and made the satellites fall back to Earth. The ionosphere is a fascinating part of our atmosphere. It's where Earth meets space. Where air is energetically charged, partially turning into plasma, making it magnetic. It reflects radio waves, and it also protects us on the ground from the sun's high energy particles. But the ionosphere is a dynamic system, always in motion, expanding and contracting, often reaching out as far as 600 kilometers into space. Understanding the ionosphere is an important science. Predicting its movement, measuring its magnetic effects on radio wave propagation, looking for military applications to potentially weaponize our atmosphere. And today science needs to predict how this complex system interacts with low Earth orbit satellites. Finland has long been at the forefront of ionospheric research, building instruments to measure the sky in the 19th century. Maybe this inspiration was because Finland is under a northern sky full of auroral activity. And today this research continues in Finland at the University of Helsinki. They have a world-leading department studying space physics. I reached out to Professor Mina Palmeroth to answer questions about our ionosphere. She kindly offered to talk to me, and I think you will find her knowledge and new research fascinating. So welcome. I'm so honored to have you here to today. And the ionosphere is really so important and so misunderstood. My YouTube audience and and people who are interested in science absolutely have heard of the ionosphere and they get it all muddled up and they don't know what it is, they don't know where it is. So wonderful to have you here. And let's start with this most basic question is, what, where is the ionosphere? How far does it go out? And why is it called an ionosphere? 
Yes. So ionosphere is shortly just the upper part of our atmosphere, the part of our atmosphere which is electrically charged in a way. So our atmosphere here on Earth, we are we have air which is not electrically charged. It's a gas which goes like you know from one country to another country, and then you have winds and so on, temperatures and so on. But ionosphere is the upper part of the atmosphere where some of the particles in the atmosphere are uh, charged. So there are electrons and ions basically, which makes this medium electrically charged and therefore it has to be called with some other name than atmosphere and therefore because it's uh there are lots of ions it's called ionosphere oh perfect so so if effectively a part of it is a plasma it's it and the plasma is um has negative and positive charges which um can be affected by magnetism uh, and it gets yes. this charge, our atmosphere gets this charge and it has become uh, and partially ionized because it's right at the very top of our planet. Yes. And it's been, am I correct in saying it, it becomes ionized from the energy from our sun? Yes, there are actually two uh, ways in which the ionosphere is ionized. So plasma is the fourth state of matter. We have solid, liquid, gas, and plasma. And if you get heat, put heat to the solid, it becomes liquid. If you put heat to liquid, it becomes gas. If you put heat to gas, it becomes plasma. So, um, for example, molecules or atoms may uh, be stripped of their electrons by external radiation coming from the sun, or the second way of ionizing our at atmospheric, upper atmospheric region is by precipitating from precipitation from outer space. So actually the ionosphere is not the outermost part of our space. So if we think about our planet as a system, we have the planet, which is the body, the where we live now. Yep. We have the atmosphere on top of it. Then we have the ionosphere on top of the atmosphere. And above that, we have what is called magnetosphere. Yeah. And magnetosphere is our magnetized dom domain, which is controlled by our own, our planetary magnetic field. And uh, this magnetic field is very dynamic. Right. And it accelerates those particles which are coming from the sun in processes which are internal to our magnetosphere. And right. those processes then launch those particles and they precipitate into the atmosphere. And those energetic particles, which are coming from our space, accelerated by our processes within our magnetosphere, they strip those electrons out of those atoms and molecules. Right. So in summary, we have two, two ionizing mechanism, mechanisms, the UV radiation from the sun right. that kicks electrons out of the atoms and molecules and therefore makes plasma. And then these acceleration processes in the magnetosphere, which precipitate particles into the atmosphere and kick those electrons out of those atoms and molecules. And in this process, we also see the great aurora, which we can right. see here in Finland. I don't know if you can, guys can see it in the continental Europe, but... <laughs> not, it, not here in southern France, but I've lived in, in, in North America and certainly uh, have seen... Um... Uh, Aurora, yeah, and it, it it's wonderful. Here's a really good question that I think people um, don't understand. They kind of see a model of the Earth and a map, and they think the atmosphere stops. And I don't think it really stops. I, I think no. it just fades away, and yeah. there is a, a percentage of less and less and less. But would would you would you would you agree that our, our planet? has a kind of a, you know, the atmosphere doesn't have a, an end, it just gets weaker. Yep, exactly like this. So at some point uh, at Earth, here where we are now, we here we, ha we are in 100% atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And then it, uh, still in about uh, 60 kilometers of altitude, we are still in the 100% atmosphere. But then starts this transition uh, region, 
where uh, there are lots of gradients in all parameters in density, temperature, ionizing, uh, the fraction of uh, particles that are ionized, very many uh, parameters that are rapidly changing. And actually, it is this layer now uh, from about 80 kilometers to 120 kilometers and sometimes even 600 kilometers oh, wow. where we are talking about. Actually, I'm very often using the word ignorosphere right. because we don't know so much about this uh, region. So, so in effect, uh, we are first in the atmosphere, then when we go upwards, uh, at some point we go into a transition region, right. which is a layer, and in this layer all parameters change rapidly, or within this layer they change. So at some point then we don't have any, for example, oxygen atoms anymore. Right. Uh, but, but we but still the, have we still have our atmosphere uh, as it as it gets ionized and as it moves out to a tremendous distance to a point where our your wonderfully coined ignorosphere goes way up into space to the point where it could even interact with things in in orbit yes exactly so so i would say that um our planet planet consists of atmosphere, ionosphere, and the magnetosphere, because that right. is cons that whole system consists or makes our planetary near Earth environment. So things that happen far out in space uh, in the magnetosphere, they have a tremendous effect on things like aurora, which we can see by our eyes from looking right. at the surface of our uh, planet. So, yeah. so basically, if we are limiting ourselves in talking like uh, our planet is just this body, uh, right. the sphere, right? It's not so because there are several phenomena which are affecting our daily lives, which are born in Way space out there, right? That's right, and those are the the most important regions for our daily lives here, right? Uh, on, on Earth. Are what, what it seems to me that what makes planet Earth so special is our magnetosphere and 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 the the fact that we still have a you know a stable atmosphere unlike Mars uh, that apparently was you know whose atmosphere was possibly eroded. Uh, due yeah, to that's the right. Lack of ma magnetism. The big takeaway is that our atmosphere. Um, transitions and slowly fades away to a tremendous height. Let's talk a bit more about the ionization process. Um, mm -hmm. When we talk about ionization, and you clearly uh, talked about plasma being the fourth state of matter, um, is it? Are these molecules? Are these atoms of the? atmosphere that we breathe down on earth do they still exist what how, how tell us more about how a what is plasma and how uh, how does it work i mean uh, is it still oxygen and carbon dioxide and nitrogen yeah this is an excellent question so we have different plasma regions uh in the vicinity of our earth if if we start from the uh, surface of our planet the ionization starts at about 80 kilometers altitude where we start to have electrons and then the uh, constituents of the atmosphere in ionized manner but only about 0.1 percent of the particles uh -huh. at this height are ionized. But anyway, the ionization, I mean, plasma physics is, uh, is a field which uh, investigates this fourth state of matter, so the plasma. And we already know that e even if 0.1% of the particles are ionized, already that has clear plasma uh, characteristics. And then when we go upwards, uh, from the 80 kilometers, at some point we start to have only electrons and protons. So those heavier elements of our atmosphere are mainly staying 
closer to our planet and further away from the planet, uh, we have protons and electrons. And then when we go outside of our magnetic domain, called the magnetosphere, right. uh, this is when we um, then uh, are, we go to solar wind. And in the solar wind, we mainly have protons and electrons, right. some alpha particles, but right. But uh, so you so you asked like what is uh, well, how does plasma work? Okay, here comes the definition. Right. Plasma is the fourth state of matter, and it is a collection of charged particles where uh, collective electromagnetic effects are important. Right. So uh, we are basically talking about a gas where uh, the gas is charged right. and it feels electromagnetic fields. It feels electric fields and magnetic fields. And then also other collective phenomena such as waves are important in behavior of plasma. Okay. So in our planetary system, our uh, ionosphere and magnetosphere, we have, well, we, our planet has a relatively strong magnetic field, mm -hmm. uh, which is a dipole. And therefore we have this, uh, for example, we can see that uh, north is, uh, we can see the northward direction from a compass because compass is reacting, reacting to the magnetic field. So our plasmas here uh, near our planet, they feel our magnetic field. Right. And then there are all kinds of processes which create electric fields and all those processes, magnetic fields, electric fields, and waves control the behavior of the plasma. So we have lots of unknown and unpredictable processes wow. here in Earth, which we do not know yet. Wow. But even, even so, they are uh, affecting our daily lives because uh, we have this thing called space weather. So right. similarly, as we have weather here on Earth, we also have weather on space which is made up of these uh, plasma characteristics. And those processes basically affect, it. they affect our satellite signals, the places where the satellites fly, I mean, those orbits. Right. Uh, they, they can even affect our power grids on Earth. So there are several space weather phenomena which are born from these processes that we don't completely understand. Oh, uh, that's wonderful, thank you. But we are very cl clever as humans. And tell me about when engineers and scientists first realized that a magnetic layer, an energized layer of the ionosphere could be used to um, bounce and transmit radio signals for a longer distance by, by reflecting uh, off the Earth. Um, because we are surrounded by a field of energy which um, is magnetic. So you can affect it with RF energy and things. So d tell me what you know about the history of the ionosphere and radio, long distance radio transmission. Yes. So um, in the beginning of radio broadcasting, when, when, uh, when radios were invented, uh, those people who were um, launching those first radio signals, they noticed that uh, those signals go much further than <laughs> than they were kind of calculating. Right. And they uh, kind of deduced that there has to be a layer uh, above our Earth in uh, where the radio signal is uh, is reflected. Uh -huh. And this la layer was called then. E for electricity. Right. And today we are, when we are looking at those ionospheric uh, characteristics, we still have the E layer. That's the uh, uh, most uh, earthward layer of the ionosphere. And then after that, we have D and F layers. So the people who have uh -huh. uh, studied the atmosphere um, took the E layer from these early uh radio transmission uh studies and then the layers that were found afterwards were named d and f like in alphabetical order from e so um so exactly from the early radio 
right uh, transmissions we knew that we had we had to have a, an electrified layer above our heads and this is all these e d and f layers they're all in what is called the ionosphere don't yes they, they need to have the the um magnetic charge the semi plasma state to actually reflect um radio waves so the radio waves are uh, reflected already from the e layer right and then th those layers which are above the e layer the d and f layer they have different characteristics and oh, they are so right. distinctively different from the e layer that they have been given an, another name oh yeah that, that it's just so fascinating so looking at the history of physics and looking at the history of uh, military and weaponization, it seems that there was a great interest in the ionosphere because it could be a way, if only you could affect the ionosphere, you could possibly switch off long distance radio transmissions. <laughs> and weren't there experiments um, to experiment to look if you could modify the ionosphere in a way which would be beneficial to say switch it off for um for transmissions this is again a little bit out of my expertise area but as far as i'm aware right. uh, there is um uh, still an active uh, one of the active uh research areas in ionosphere is called man made effects so so there are, for, for example, there are heating uh, right. experiments where people uh, who are utilizing some heating facilities here on Earth, which are basically transmitters of electromagnetic waves, right. they send those uh, waves uh, above, above the atmosphere <clears throat> to the ionosphere, where they then, uh, these waves are um, interacting with the plasma and heating the uh, plasma above uh in the ionosphere and uh then they can uh kind of monitor for example by spacecraft or radars uh how this heating was efficient so this is one of the right. one of the ways in which uh, ionosphere is researched today uh right. and this is called man-made effects but i'm not a, very much an expert in man-made effects no no of course and m much of that research although it it takes place at universities it's also b very much seems to be military controlled because there could be a a weaponization or a, a military advantage by modifying the uh ionosphere um if the ionosphere can be modified by heating it so is it possible that the ionosphere could be used to deorbit satellites, uh, low Earth orbit LEO satellites? Uh, is that a program that you've ever heard about? No, um, there are ways in which uh, the atmosphere can be heated or the ionosphere can be heated, which affects the orbits of the satellites. Right. But I haven't heard that nobody has done that so effectively that it, it could uh, right. so so that the man-made effects are not so effective as the natural uh, effect. So the natural uh, right. effect here is called joule heating. Right. So joule heating is a, a phenomenon where an electric current goes through a medium. And it's, this is exactly how what happens in our ionosphere. So we, our ionosphere is an is a medium. It it has contains uh, matter, and then there are these uh, electric currents which are made by our magnetosphere, and they close through the uh, uh, ionized upper atmosphere. So right. the ionosphere. So effectively, it's like a water heater. So you put water into a heater, and then you put uh, electricity on and then the water heats uh -huh. so when 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 you have these uh electric currents that go through the medium right and when these currents intensify that heats the medium and it and expands it expands like exactly as the same way you can you go we right. Finns go to sauna and we uh throw water into the uh what is it called the yeah, the little fire and it makes steam. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 called kiwas in Finnish, but okay, we great. throw water into that into that thing and then it 
uh, makes steam and that lifts upward. So, so you right. notice in, for example, in sauna, you notice that the heated material is uh, in close to the roof, whereas your oh, feet yeah. may may be even cold. If right, but anyway, so the, the same thing happens in the ionosphere. So when we heat the ion or a phenomenon hits the ionosphere, ionosphere lifts up. Right. And then if, if you have a satellite here, you are right. you are a little satellite kind of going in the atmosphere and some suddenly something heats, you notice that oh no, now I'm in a much uh denser plasma. Right. right. So that heating uh increases friction friction on those satellite orbits and what happens to the satellites? Satellite goes here innocently then something heats up satellite drops because there is additional friction in the satellite orbit due to this heating and by the way this exact process uh, was behind uh, the loss of the starlink satellites in 2022 february so there was a relatively minor uh, space weather event which caused currents to go through the ionospheric medium right. and those currents heated the ionosphere lifted the ionosphere upwards and then the satellites were lost because their orbits were decaying and uh, this is like this is an e excellent example of those unpredictable things that we don't still know in ionosphere because um, for example if we knew uh, that there was going to be this right. joule heating event when the Starlink satellite were launched, launched, we could have told that, well, don't launch them yet because it's now a, a bad time to launch. But right. nobody was able to predict it because right. we do not, we understand it in qualitative manner. We know that mm. this thing happens and it occurs, but we don't know how much right. the atmosphere lifts and we don't know in a kind of quantitative detail how right. this uh, phenomenon works and therefore we need science to still understand this so finland what's the connection and why is finland a center of excellence for the study of the ionosphere um does finland have a specific um, history or an, an obviously geographical uh, area in the world that makes it unique for studying ionos the ionosphere? Yes, yeah, so I'm I'm the director of the Finnish Center of Excellence in Research of Sustainable Space and one of the parts that we are uh, researching in this Center of Excellence is the ionosphere. We are also studying the magnetosphere and the solar wind and the sun in the Center of Excellence, but ionosphere is part of it. Right. And why is Finland doing research in in space? Well, it has to do uh, with basically, I think, with two facts. One of them is that we have a long history of uh, data records. So the first magnetometers that actually, I mean, if you put a magnetometer, it will uh, measure uh, space weather because uh, those space weather uh, processes are creating magnetic disturbances, which you can then measure with the mag magnetometer. Yes. First magnetomet magnetometer was uh, established in Finland in 1838. That's... 1838. Right. And this was also the start of the Finnish Meteorological Institute. Right. Finland established those magnetometers. And after that, we have been measuring magnetic variations. And because we have had those uh, data records and we have seen those aurora above our heads, we have started to think that like, what is going on and therefore we have a strong space research yeah, uh, community fantastic. here. Yeah, well, well done, Finland. And it goes back to the end of the 19th century. That's really interesting. Well, I, I, th I think that we've covered a lot of really fascinating topics. Uh, I'd like to end by asking you specifically what um, what your research is and what what future exciting things are happening in your university with the ionosphere. Yeah, so um, so there are so many things that I could mention here, but um, 
first of all, we are uh, developing the world's most accurate space environment simulation called Flaciator, and this gives an unprecedented uh, description of the near Earth space. So we can really start to see what's happening in space and start to understand these unpredictable phenomena, such as joule heating, and which I which I mentioned. Yeah. Then we are. Um, I'm also the author of a very exciting citizen science uh, study, oh. where where the citizen science scientists in Finland found a new auroral form, and it turned out that this um, auroral form was due to waves in this ignorosphere. So uh, so we were we were able to uh, understand the ionospheric medium by looking at those aurora. So right. aurora was kind of a method for us to understand what's happening in the ionosphere. Do, and do, this was, did, this, did, did this new phenomenon, does it have a name? Yes, the dunes. Oh. And we, <laughs> the dunes. So, if, I mean, if you go, for example, into University of Helsinki uh, website and uh, right. Google dune aurora, you we can will. find the uh, find this exciting project. My viewers on YouTube are absolutely fascin fascinated by your research on the ionosphere, and I, I think you've made it so clear. And it's so good coming from you, a professor of of physics, rather than me telling them. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you so much. It All was right. really a pleasure. <laughs> yes. And I'll, we'll you. speak soon. Thank you. Bye bye. Yes. Bye bye. bye, -bye. That was great. Thank you, Professor Palmroth. So what questions do you have now about the ionosphere? Leave questions in the comments. And because this channel is interactive social media science, your questions will lead to future film ideas. You can also join me and other patrons at my science club. Link in the description. And most of all, if you enjoyed this film, please give it a thumbs up and share a link with friends. Thanks for watching. It's because of you. The truth is out there.